I've always wanted a precise and high temperature oven for the heat treatment of steel. Hardening most carbon steels isn't difficult, but I've always wanted a little bit more of a precise approach. It's always most desirable to be able to control it accurately and to be able to hold it at that temperature for long periods of time. It was about a year ago I started working on the designs for an electric oven. And the goal for this oven, it didn't need to be extremely large, but it did need to have a form factor for a lot of the things I work with, which can be tools and parts that could have certain lengths and certain shapes and sizes that for the lower price points, a lot of the available high temperature electric ovens on the market just won't fit. Over the last few weeks, I've been able to actually put together my heat treating oven, and I'd like to show you how I did that. Now to answer a lot of questions early off the bat, I put links down in the description so that if you do want to go down this path as well, you can get the same things I did and learn in some of the same ways I did. The purchase links are all affiliate links, so shameless promotion there, but it doesn't cost you anything extra, and it does throw a few pennies my way to keep breaking taps and end mills. I came up with a design, and that told me what parts I needed to get, since most of them needed to be ordered specially. To start with, the whole oven is built out of these fire bricks. They insulate very well, and they'll take high temperatures. The brain is this PID temperature controller, it uses one of these K-type thermocouples and then turns on the heating element through a series of relays. All of that's connected with these ceramic terminal blocks and some high temperature wire. I also got a short length of nichrome coil for the heating element. The nichrome heating element wasn't very impressive after some testing, so I purchased some Canthal A1 wire. It's just as inexpensive and easy to get, and it has better durability properties, and it has published specifications, making it easier to calculate power. I had to wind it into a coil though, and I did that on the lathe in a spring winding technique. I made a custom tool that has a MIG welding tip on it, and this helps feed the wire over onto a mandrel. I then set up the lathe as if to cut a thread away from the chuck, the resulting coil was very satisfactory and consistent, although you could probably use any kind of spinning tool to make this. I made a worksheet for calculating wire size, length, and power. you find that in the description. It's just some quick estimations and calculations. My 22 gauge wire ended up being about 40 ohms, which at 240 volts ends up being about 1450 watts. It occurred to me, for some of the angled cuts I'll be doing for this whole project, I could use my miter saw with a chop saw blade in it. It had the same specs, all the same power and everything, and now I can make some more complex angled cuts, like for the legs here, which would be otherwise a compound cut. The 11 gauge sheet metal for the base of it, I'm just cutting with the angle grinder. It's messy and it's loud, but it works perfect for stuff like this. This is definitely the most welding I've done in any project, and it was a great opportunity to practice my TIG skills, or lack thereof. There was definitely some funny positioning and stuff I hadn't done before, and it's the kind of stuff that you wouldn't think to practice until you actually have to do it. So, really good experience. While the base cooled, I hit the bricks. Before they could be laid into place, I had to carve the trough in them for the heating element. I laid it out in Sharpie and then was able to carve the bricks with a file, and any hard implement would cut into these bricks. They're very soft. The dust coming off of them is extremely horrible for you, so I was cleaning them constantly and I wore the respirator the entire time, which was fun on a hot day. I made sure that the pathways lined up nice and perfectly, and then I marked the orientation so that when I go to lay the bricks in place, everything will still line up and be just perfect.
start building my high temperature brick box, I'm using some refractory cement that I actually got locally from Menards. It's really thick, it's thicker than peanut butter, so it's not super easy to spread. I'm covering the top of this base here. This will be the floor of the oven, so for a little protection, I'm just putting a layer on top of those bricks. You can see the back half of that one brick. It got tore up pretty bad in shipping. A little bit of refractory cement on it as well, kind of patched it up, and it's not a critical area, so it's ugly, but I'm not super worried about it. I definitely prioritized strength over looks when it came to all of my brick joints. Now this box is rock solid, but I don't expect the local bricklayers union to offer me a job anytime soon. <laughs> Before the top goes on is going to be the easiest time to get the heating element in. This requires a little bit of stretching to get the initially wound coils to the right length to fit in the trough. I made staples out of extra heating element wire, and these just push right into the soft fire brick. The ends of the heating element I twisted over multiple times to lower their resistance to keep them from glowing outside of the oven. They attach to this terminal block easily enough, and I should have pre-drilled the hole that I used to attach it. Luckily the test firing revealed that it worked nicely. After a couple of days of bricklaying, even though it was kept in a sealed container, the refractory cement became even thicker and harder to work with. It was a bit of a pain, ultimately it just made it a little bit uglier and some of the seams larger, so that's definitely something worth noting if I was to ever do this again. I opted to build out the frame of this oven using 2 inch by 1 8 inch steel bar. Sheet metal may have been better, I just didn't want to store and handle all that sheet metal. And this seems to work well enough for having a frame to hang off the control box, the door, and to keep everything generally safe and together. The door is as simple as two bricks mortared together with some frame around it as well. I evened up the front of the oven just with a palm sander and a vacuum. This is making a terrific mess, but it got it nice and flat to meet up with the door. The hinge is an uncoated hinge I got from my local metal supplier. Most of them are chrome or brass or zinc plated. This one came plain steel. It seemed pretty heavy duty, but once I got it in place, it allowed for a little bit of sag. Two hinges would have been more ideal. Luckily, my handle design will help fix this and keep the door in place when it's shut. I drilled and tapped a hole in some half inch by eighth inch strap. And we're going to put some all thread in there, and I ground off all the extra zinc plating on that with the wire brush. I just welded this in place, and I prepared a grill handle. This is one of those coil handles the same way I brushed off all the zinc for welding. I had the fan on and the door open because there was still some soot and fumes that were kicked up by the welding process. That stuff's nasty, don't mess with it. The handle, as you can see, overhangs both sides of the door. After an upturn is bent into that inside tab, it'll catch the frame nicely and close the door in place perfectly. The system to actually keep the door closed will be based off of a hinge made out of this DOM tubing and 3 8 inch round bar. I ground a flat into the DOM tubing to help register it onto the frame for weldment. The round bar had a hole center drilled into it and then tapped quarter by 20. A piece of stainless steel all thread is then put in place and welded.
The DOM tubing is then welded to the frame with my swinging threaded bar in place. Regrettably, I didn't get it perfectly straight up and down. It functions perfectly fine, but it's just going to annoy me. This piece of angle iron welded to the door will be the latch on the door side for everything to tighten upon. For the handle that'll tighten down and keep everything in place, I'm using aluminum for well, no real reason, I just happen to have some and it's fun to machine. <laughs> I squared up a tube and made a plug that fit into it. I was going to weld these together and, well, when I went to weld them I had a really awful time. After being really frustrated I figured out that I never turned my argon on for this procedure. I was mostly focused on getting my AC settings correct. I ground that up and then had a relatively decent time welding it. It was good aluminum practice. I still ground them down though just so it would be a little bit more even and then paint will cover the rest of those sins. All the electrical guts of this oven are going to need a home, and for that I'm using some 4x4 square tubing. This is 11 gauge or 120 wall. I'm welding this little piece of angle iron in the front, and this will be what the faceplate will ultimately screw into. The faceplate itself was actually a fun little project within a project. I modeled it up in Fusion 360 at first to actually 3D print it to get a feel for everything. And then we came up with a cam routine and took it over to the CNC milling machine. And this is 8th inch thick, uh, 11 gauge sheet metal, it's the same stuff I used for the base of the oven. I'm going pretty conservatively because I'm using the super glue and painter's tape holding technique. You can see I'm using a piece of 2x4 tubing as my base for that. And I was also testing out the tool holders, the tool itself, and the tool holding system, and my new coolant sprayer I made that uses a mist. Now via the magic of film editing, I wasn't entirely honest with you. I didn't have the bracket in place when I cut this out on the CNC machine, so I had to cut those holes later on the drill press after I welded the bracket in place. Everything could then be fit up and the holes transferred so that they could be drilled and threaded. The faceplate could then be cleaned up and given a coat of paint. I then drilled and tapped some holes into the controller box to hold things inside of it like these two relays that'll drive the heating element. I'm test fitting them on the outside just to make sure everything lines up nicely. I also drilled and tapped a hole for this terminal block that I 3D printed. And this will actually hold the incoming power line, grounding it to the box and providing a secure and insulated attachment point for the two hot leads coming in. My fitment of all the parts that are going to be inside the box is double and triple checked and luckily everything is going to fit. I welded on this bar to the top of the box and then I kind of redesigned the way I wanted to attach the box to the frame so I had to cut and grind those welds away. I've still got a long way to go as far as welding is concerned, but I feel like my skills were increased quite a bit just by this project alone. Mm -hmm. 
Nothing really hides sins like a good coat of paint. And it being 100 degrees outside meant I didn't have to wait very long for it all to dry. It turns out to watch me wire up the guts for this oven was so boring it caused my camera's battery to die. The whole electrical scheme for this, though, is pretty simple. It's all based around the PID, which has a number of ins and outs, and those control things like the two solid-state relays. Those 25-amp relays each control a hot leg of the 240-volt incoming line. There's, of course, the K-type thermocouple, which the PID uses to measure the internal temperature of the oven and turn on the relays as necessary. And then a couple of fuses coming in from the main lines, as well as a switch. I wired everything up so that it would slide into my control box just so and fit into place well, more or less perfectly. Which it actually did. This was kind of a tricky operation, but everything got in there just fine. The screws holding the relays in place were actually already partially in there, and I was able to just get them slid in and tightened down from the outside. I then drilled the hole for the thermocouple and slid it in so that it would be right in the middle of the heating chamber. The best part about turning this oven on for the first time was that nothing exploded, caught fire, or electrocuted me. Everything worked as expected. The PID reads in Celsius, so setting it at 875 is really more like 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. I think you can perch PID controllers that display both. I have no doubts that this oven could do well over 1000 degrees Celsius, but I haven't been patient enough to try it out yet. It takes about 15 to 17 minutes just to come to this temperature. I also upgraded the switch to this snazzy little number with the cover on it. One issue I did have with the first couple of firings was that the PID was kicking the relays off for the heating element about 15 degrees short of the target temperature. It turns out that there's an automatic tuning process you need to send the PID through on the first time you turn it on. Once I did this, I got much more accurate, stable, and consistent temperatures. It was pretty stark night and day difference. I definitely had to test it out on some steel, so I put this 2-inch round bar, this isn't anything special, just some cold rolled, uh, in there for about 20 minutes, and this is the result. Uh, pretty neat, pretty impressive, and it's definitely going to work. I also need to fix the heating coils. I didn't put enough staples in this side, and it expanded and well, snuck out, so it's going to work better once I fix that. Well, this is a pretty cool project I cannot wait to use on some homemade tools and other hard parts in the future. If you like stuff like this, go ahead and check out my other videos if you haven't. I do a lot of home workshop metalworking. Check me out on Patreon and Instagram as well, as well as my own website, practicalrenaissance.com. Anyway, I'll see you in the next video.